Hello, everybody. Here we are back again this week. Did y'all have a nice weekend? Don't you find that things are just kind of, I mean, of course, there's been chaos in the streets, but as far as the pandemic goes, I don't know, it just seems like things are kind of settling down and settling in a little bit. Let me see who we have here. Ooh, we have a lot of people here. Uh, Ramon from the Philippines, what's up? I don't know what's up. It's uh, it's Monday, June 8th. Hi, Anime Foley from Pittsburgh. Um, Fitchburg, excuse me. And Donna Lynn, uh, excited for today. Hi, Beth. Uh, Deb Moore Robertson from Falls Church, Virginia. Hi, Ida. Ida, how are you today? Um, let me just see. I've got other people coming on. It like all of a sudden clicks me down. Um, Jeanette Persons from Lisbon, North Dakota, and Tammy Lewis. Uh, oh, your son flew home and surprised you. How fabulous is that? And Beth Mack, happy Monday. Uh, Barbara Johnson coming to us from Davidson, North Carolina. Hi, Cricket. How you doing? We're about to move up to Maine. It will be very strange with no campers at camp. Uh, Linda Griffin Thomas, how you doing? Um, oh, it says, hi, uh, do you have to self-quarantine for two weeks when you go to Maine? No, because we have this entire summer camp to ourselves. Um, we won't have a crew there to get the climbing wall open since we don't have those counselors. But um, boats are out and uh, the tennis courts are there. We'll be able to, it will be a once in a lifetime opportunity for us to be a family up there on that gigantic playground, but it's going to seem pretty weird, I think. Susan Macy, hi, uh, from Nebraska. Marlene's coming to us from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, Rebecca Franick, hi. And like, who's this right here from? Wait a minute, I miss somebody. I miss somebody. Uh, Sarah Webster from Georgia. Uh, Pam, you're from Dayton, Ohio. I think I, oh yeah, Debbie. Debbie from Harrison, New York. You're not too far from me. Uh, Donna Babonis, Carol Smith from Crosswell, Michigan. Well, I'm trying to say hi to all of you, you guys, since we weren't together. Um, Bruce, I think you're, you're from Missouri. Uh, Mary Jo, uh, I've seen it. Susan Conklin, are you any relation to Bonnie Conklin, I wonder? From Niceville, is that the name of your town, Niceville? How cool is that? Niceville, Florida, is everyone nice there? Um, Mary Lou from Minnesota. Uh, let's see who else we have with us. Deborah Estelle from Boston. Oh, see, soon it's when more people come on, it jumps forward. From Boston, uh, Nancy, good morning, uh, Abusi. Uh, Sarah from Kennesaw, Al Atlanta. Um, Madeline from Coldwater today. Barbara Brown from Conway, Arkansas. Bernadette from where in um, Florida? Bernadette, Bernadette, where'd you go? From Delray Beach. Yeah, we have a house in um, West Palm Beach. Uh, so we're not too far from you down there. So listen, you guys, <clears throat> last week was tough, wasn't it? I mean, it was just so sad and worrisome and concerning for our country. But it kind of feels like maybe something is coming from it. And the, the protests all became much more peaceful, which I think the pe people who are actually protests who wanted it to be in the beginning. Um, I well understand why a lot of our guests though last week just didn't feel comfortable and they've been rebooked this week. Um, you know, it is uh, brain health month, the month of June. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna have the chief scientific, chief scientist from the National Alzheimer's Association with us <clears throat> talking about kind of where we stand now with dementia and Alzheimer's and what breakthroughs um, we could anticipate Dr. Mike Dow on Wednesday talking about the sugar brain fix, what sugar does to us. Dr. Daniel Amen on Thursday, he's such a fabulous guy, maybe one of the, the leading psychiatrists in America. He wrote, change your brain, change your life, change your brain, change your grades. They're all uh, had a re memory recovery. Uh, and then on Friday, we're going to have a fun day to, to sign off with Robin McGraw. You all know Dr. Phil. It's Dr. Phil's wife, she's great. She wrote a book similar to mine and similar to the book we're gonna talk about today. Hers was called um, 
what's age got to do with it? I immediately think of Tina Turner, don't you? What's age got to do with it? Um, but we have been talking, you know, a lot about our lives, about women and how, um, I don't know, how aging for women is, it just seems like it's a lot different, uh, not only than men, but it's way different than previous generations. I think if you asked 10 people today, what is middle age? You would get 10 different answers. Uh, but we've all been kind of conditioned to think of middle aged. I don't know, almost like it's a four letter word or something. When the reality for women today, it's nothing like our mothers or grandmothers experienced. I mean, I think that today women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, dare I say even 70s, since I'm going there pretty soon, we're living a much more active and vibrant and probably even you know healthy and more fit life than previous generations. But our society, our youth obsessed culture, it kind of like instills a fear in us that when we hit midlife, whenever you want, wherever that happens, that we stop being appealing or relevant or, and ultimately that we don't have options open to us anymore. Um, that it's kind of too late for us. Well, I don't think so. And neither does my guest today, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. You guys may have heard her on her podcast or she's been on a lot of different TV shows. Um, and she wrote um, this book, Your Best Age Is Now. And um, and she says it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and she uses data from scientific research. Plus, she is a psychotherapist. So she uses her own life experience. Um, and she says that rather than midlife being the beginning of your decline, that it should really be a fantastic time to kind of begin pursuing your own dreams. And as you guys know, all of you who've read my book, you know, I, she sent me her book. This I got it on Friday and I was reading it over the weekend. I was like saying, wow, you know, when an idea comes of age and it needs to be talked about, more than one person has talks about it because she, I mean, she's obviously a psychotherapist. I'm just a girl <laughs> talking to a bunch of you girls, but it does call for my shameless book plug of the day. Why did I come into this room? I came today to talk to you guys and to talk to Robbie. Let's say hi, everyone, to Robbie. Hey, hey how are you doing? Thank you good? Thank you so much for having me. I'm so Listen, excited to be you. I remember you interviewed me for this book. I did. You interviewed me, and I was looking through. You interviewed Hoda and Kathy Lee. We just had Kathy Lee here on the show. Oh. You interviewed Suzanne Summers. So listen, I found myself. I'm on page 49, and yeah. I'm in a chapter that talks about resilience. Yeah. And it's so interesting because we both even have, we don't call them the same, but they're about the same things that affect all of us. Um, after interviewing Hoda and and Suzanne and, and me and other women like us, what did you learn from all those interviews about the importance of resilience and how finding our resilience is kind of let us keep moving forward because after life, you know, lumps in the road. I mean, because we all have them. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's such a good question. And one of the things that I noticed amongst my midlife mentors <laughs> is that they were not women who stayed stuck in the past. Yeah. They used the past as valuable lessons. And again, they'd all been through challenges, gained some humility, but there was definitely a gratefulness for everything that they experienced. And what I also noticed, Joan, was that they were not subscribing to this cultural script, which was limiting. They almost created their own map for life. And because of that, they were able to create their own way and, and to succeed and to create their own rules. Many of them were very grateful, but it was a very active way of pursuing what they wanted to create in life. Interesting. You call it um, a new midlife. In fact, the first chapter of the book is called It's Time for a New Midlife. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. It's obviously what made me write my book as well. Um, what does that mean to you, a new 
midlife? And how do we get help women change their perception of yeah. that time in everyone's life? I, I actually had a, a situation in my life, and, and you can understand this, Joan, I'm sure. I was interviewing for a TV pilot that probably never happened. And the woman asked me my age, which I think is illegal. But it, is, it is illegal. Yeah, I thought it was illegal. But I told her anyway, because I've never been one to not share my age. Yeah. And I remember getting off of that phone call feeling like, oh, my goodness, has, has you know, my, my career just had, topped out? Is there really nothing else for me? Am I too old to create a difference or to be chosen? And after I got off the phone, I said, this is not you. And this is not what you are noticing. I, I started to really look around, and I live in New York City, all these women who were in midlife, and they were fabulous. They were in shape. They looked amazing. They were on top of their game. And yet at the same time, I was looking at the literature out there, and your book was not written yet, so I couldn't find your book. Uh, <laughs> and, and they were kind of negative. It was all about loss and what you're losing and how to come to terms with being invisible. Some of them were funny, like making fun of your, your sagging butt or the <laughs> wrinkles that you have. And it just didn't sit right with me. It didn't feel accurate uh, or given what I was seeing in my practice or given what I was seeing amongst my friends. So I started to do some research and look at what was going on out there in the scientific world. And my hunch was correct that the science was not proving what our culture was enforcing. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to put a compilation of information out there so that women could have a guide to see the new reality out there that our culture was not embracing. And it was yeah. in fact harming women's self-esteem. They were internalizing an expiration date that should be there. Absolutely, we've got uh, here, book sounds interesting, says Jerry. Um, here's an pertinent appointment, uh, let's see, Cricket. She says, um, it's a, such an important concept. I've started reading the resilience factor, seven keys to finding your inner strength and overcoming life's hurdles. And now I'm going to have to check out Dr. Ludwig's book. Well, it's a good one. I'm telling you, Cricket. Um, you know, what you're really kind of referencing, except... This word reinvention, I think it just gets used so much that people are, it's kind of like, what do you mean? Um, yeah. I know I know personally, I've reinvented myself so many times, you know, since leaving GMA. What advice would you give to women who, who need to start, um, who need to get unstuck? Because sometimes I don't think women even understand that, that they, um, it's time to, to reinvent themselves. And instead of thinking like, oh, I'm not my old job. I People are telling me I can't do that anymore and replace that thinking. You, you really have to just like, it's almost like you flip it or you flip a switch and you say, no, I'm going to talk about what I have to offer, my life experience, all the skills I have, all the contacts I have, and all the dreams that I've had. Well, I think the interesting thing is that really, if you were to interview many women during midlife, they would tell you they feel better in terms of their self-esteem yes. than they ever had. And if you ask them, would you want to go back to being 20? They very often would say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I like the way my jeans I wouldn't. Are. But no, no, because yeah. think about the insecurity that came with being young. There was almost this disease to please and to prove oneself. And the wonderful thing about midlife is you realize you can rely on yourself. So that's the first part, to listen to your soul and to figure out how do you have a meaningful life? What are your strengths? What have you always wanted to do? How can you be purposeful in life? And really, I think reinvention is all about being creative I think it's a little bit about being rebellious. And I talk about that in my book, kind of barring from- We should your, encourage that. Yeah. You need, you're women need to be rebellious lost. at that age. Smart, smart rebellion, really rebelling against ideas that tell you you can't. Yeah. And, and to really consider your life and yourself as a creative art project 
that you're always building on. Who do you want to be? What do you need to do to get there? And once you start there, it just is little steps along the way. You know, maybe you need to get more education in a particular topic. Maybe you need to find out what's going on in the world or in the area of perhaps the new job that you want to pursue or the new role you want to pursue. The nice thing is that once you've hit midlife, you know a lot of people. You yeah. can ask questions and, and really you have that kind of built in network that you can rely on. So it's really a combination of being willing to risk. Joan, you talk about this, like going where the angels go, going where- <laughs> Going where the angels fear to tread. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you how often I feel scared and nervous all the time. I do it anyway, and you know what? Once you take action, your anxiety mm -hmm. goes away. Yeah, I always say whenever anyone asks you if you can do something or if you wanna do something, just say yes, and then go oh. figure out how to do it. We have a few people who are saying um, so much pressure to reinvent yourself these days. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. That's Maureen Murphy. But a lot of other people have said, Ida says, I've learned that with age comes wisdom. Barbara, um, she, Barbara Selleck says, much more confident at midlife. Um, and Barbara, a lot of people are saying that they definitely feel more comfortable. I'd love to know what you guys out there, when is midlife? Like it's a what, moving target. Yeah, what? it's a moving target, isn't it? Like, I don't even know what it used to be in the old days. Like old was 60 in yeah. the old days. So I think midlife, like in the old days was like from 30 to 40. Can you imagine that being the case today? You're still like almost a kid when you're 30 or 35. If somebody were, and it's so interesting because you remember the book Passages. Right? Oh, Gail Sheehy. I've interviewed her many times. Okay. Did you ever ask Gail when she felt she hit midlife? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. Well, I saw her. I saw her at, a, a, I guess she was giving a book talk about her latest book at the time. I think it was a memoir. And she said she felt she hit midlife in the 70s at 35. Think about wait, that. Wait, wait, So in the 1970s, she felt like she hit midlife at 35. 35. And or I didn't. Well, right. I mean, 35. First I was at the all, beginning of getting the engines going and getting the train on the track and everything when you're in and, your 30s. And, and in your 40s, I felt like that was like that. That I don't know if you call that midlife. That was like at the peak, like the 40s. I just interviewed some. I was just on a podcast and she said, I've ha I'm having a big, uh, hard time. I just turned 40. I feel like it's over. I said, are you kidding? The <laughs> 40s are the best. I agree with you, Joan. I loved my 40s. You're looking good. And, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're more confident. But, but you, you bring up such a good point. It's a moving target. And so there was a study done in England that asked women when they felt they finally arrived at midlife. And it was somewhere in their 50s, like 53 to 55. I would say that. Yeah. Which is the reason if we're going to live these days until 90 to 100, which... Right. And the lo and the, the more in the future you go, the longer people are going to live. That's and right. And that would make 50, 55 mid, the midpoint. And so we see that over the decades... Things have really changed. Now, when Gail Sheehy felt that she was midlife at 35, everyone was getting married at the same time. Everyone yeah. was having kids Younger. at the same time. Empty nest. Now with modern science, and listen, you were the poster girl for this. <laughs> women, before anyone was doing it, you were way ahead of your time. Women can have children at any age, just like yeah. men. We yeah. have options because of science, because of knowledge. We yeah. can live longer and live younger longer. In fact, it's taking us, all of us, a lot longer to grow up. So we feel younger longer for good reason. That's why it's a moving target. But I wanna mention something to the, the person that asked the question, I still don't know what I wanna do because yeah. I do my private practice. And what I would recommend is you ask yourself the question, what would your younger self advise your older self? So good. We often say, what would your older self advise your younger self? You're but right. 
when you're younger, you're in touch with the I can do's. Yep. And sometimes in touch with a passion that you did not pursue because it wasn't right or it wasn't okay or you're, you didn't want to disappoint your parents. <laughs> the other thing is really to explore your daydreams and your fantasies as a starting point and see what you're drawn to, see what you love. And, and take it from there. Enjoy exploring and enjoy not knowing and discovering. Yeah, a lot of people agree. Um, Carol Smith, I loved my 40s. I felt like my life was just beginning. I agree with you, Carol. Um, <clears throat> here, midlife for me was the 50s. I agree with you too, Jerry. Um, my mother is the most youthful minded and healthy 90 year old I know always eager to take on any topic. Good for her. Deborah, tell her hello from all of us. Um, Beth, Mac, we get wiser with age, but unfortunately we face age discrimination with employers once you hit the age 55. Once they figure out how old are you, are, you are, it's curtains. <laughs> I, I mean, I talk well, about that in my book too. And listen, yeah. you've interviewed Kate White. She was the former editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan. And yeah during midlife became an award-winning novelist and she gave yeah. a recommendation. She said, you know, you have to be realistic. You always have to have a plan B. You have to understand yeah. the realities of the world. And I think more than ageism, it's salaryism. You know, once you hit a certain salary, people yeah. don't necessarily want to keep you on, but That's then we true. do have a responsibility to keep ourselves really relevant. Are you up to date on all the technology that you need to be kept up on? When you look at yourself, do you look like somebody who's bringing your A game? Would you hire yourself? And so sometimes we really <laughs> do the work and not get lazy and say, oh, well, I put in many years, so there. No, you still have a responsibility to be modern, to be fresh, to continue learning so that you have something to offer because ultimately that's what employers want. They want to see how you add value. It's interesting. We've got a good crowd here. Bernadette says, I'm very, very happy in my 70s. Susan uh, Grabois, my 40s were the best. Pam says, my 60s are awesome. And Paula Galato, she says, I'm going to be 77 and I still feel beautiful. I just started to paint and I'm loving it. I mean, this is terrific. You know, um, part of it also, though, to really complete, I think, what we're talking about, you have to go through that process of letting go, I think, because and it, it's a it's a hard process for a lot of people, you know, regrets, mistakes they think they made along the way. Maybe they didn't end up where they wanted to be. But what advice do you have for women who feel stuck? Because once you get past that, it can be awesome. But people get stuck in that. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel guilty and women, women and men are very good at self-attack, attacking <laughs> themselves. And if you feel guilty, then you're not going to allow yourself to move forward because you feel like you have to punish yourself. You know, you have to serve your sentence for not making the right choices. And life is about making some right choices and some wrong mm -hmm. choices. And the goal is to learn from them to gain wisdom. Nobody wins if you keep yourself held down. No one, no one, not the yeah. world, not yourself, not your family. So giving yourself permission to learn, grow, figure out what the lessons are, figuring out how to move forward helps everybody win. So to see it from that vantage point. We have Patty who says, I love every year I'm alive because I'm an eight year cancer survivor. I have six years. This last Friday, six years for me since I got diagnosed. Here's Beverly Helms. I'm remarried at 50. Great time in my life and my new adventure. I did exactly the same thing, Beverly. Um, I got married, remarried at 49. Maybe it, I also married a guy who was 39. Uh, that worked. Down. That worked. Um, and here, Linda, she's like me. They We adopted in our 50s a six-month-old. 
And I mean, I got to tell you, it doesn't seem, I mean, for me, it doesn't seem strange at all. I guess for some people, they might look at me and say, are you crazy? Um, here's uh, Holly Drew. I'm 57. I've raised two sets of children. The second set are special needs. And now I am ready to redirect and have some fun. You know, I think the good thing about going through that process of letting go, and and quite honestly, my advice to you, I'm not a psychotherapist, but like think of all the things that you hang on to and say, does it matter in five years? That's one of the, that's my chapter title on letting yeah. go. Will it matter in five years? Seriously. And if it won't, then let it go. But you have to like really embrace the idea that you're letting it go. Right. I think that there is a lot of shame that people live with. Yeah. And, and um, you know, maybe feeling that they are, are not allowed to let it go, that they somehow still need to um, serve penance. And once you really understand that, you know, we've all had things, we all have skeletons in our closet, right? We all have things that we wish we would have done differently, but that, you know, the, the letting go and saying, I forgive myself. We talk a lot about forgiving other people. It starts with yourself first. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself and then use the talents and skills you have to make yourself and your world and the people around you better. Yeah, I love, there's, um, I love this. Everybody has a chapter they don't read out loud. <laughs> And it's okay. So that chapter's there. Like, you know, it's you just hit, you, you hit hide. <laughs> I, I think if you realize too that everybody has that chapter, that we really yeah. are more similar than dissimilar. Um, that that's tremendously helpful. It really is. You know, when you are able to let go of things, something wonderful happens. And Robbie, you write about it and I write about it. And that is that all of a sudden you just get this increased ability to have a great sense of appreciation, a, a gratitude for life. So um, I think that that's part of, uh, to me, that's kind of the silver lining yes. of, of growing older. Yeah, I, I know I found that. I mean, and I'm sure part of it was like surviving cancer also, but Seriously, I just think that you get as you get older and you get more comfortable in your own skin and you're not trying to impress everybody all the time. Yeah. You just have this. I've talked about it to people here that I walk, I drive this beautiful drive from my house to work. And I find sometimes as I'm driving in the morning, the sun is coming down through the trees of this Connecticut forest. And I notice it. And I'm telling you, there's not a chance in the world at 30 or 40 years old, I would have noticed that. I, I, and, and I also noticed the pandemic is a little bit like midlife. It's almost this stop and pause moment where we re reevaluate life and we recognize what really matters and what's important. And that's really what midlife offers us, the ability to recognize and not take for granted some of the beautiful things that we've created in our lives or the people in our lives or the quality relationships that we have with ourselves and others. You know, part of the another thing you and I both write about and and it can really help, I think, even in this getting through this midlife stage is the importance of friends. Now, in my book, in my book, I call it friends are therapists you can drink with. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I decided I had to write. I mean, you're a psychotherapist. I wrote my book as a girl talking to a bunch of other girls and saying, guess what I found out. But I love something you wrote in your book. Um, you say, um, I love this, just as teens are thoroughly influenced by their friends, we can be too. We can begin to make good decisions, for instance, about our health by hanging around the people who are making their health a priority. Our yeah. social connections influence our physical and emotional health to such an extent that science has even come up with a new term for it. Is it epigenetics? Epigenetics. It's a, a new study, which it, it's so interesting because your mother probably said it's so important what group you hang around with, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. all of our mothers have said that. And probably as teens, we're like, eh, what does she know? But now we really <laughs> 
see how it impacts us uh, via science. And if you look at twin studies, identical twin studies, they're more alike when they're younger and growing up in the same home. But if you have one twin that works out, doesn't go in the sun, really takes care of herself, understands how to reduce her stress level versus another twin who's out in the sun, who's smoking, doesn't have the same quality of relationships, they look very different. Yeah. And, and you can see what happens via your choices. So our choices influence our gene expression. And, and that's why we can see it with identical twins because they have the same DNA, right? They have the same gene. Yeah. And we can influence how our genes get expressed by the choices that we make, by the people that we interface with. There was a study done that found out one of the biggest problems in society today is loneliness. And a yeah. big part of well-being are our social connections, the quality of our social connections. Yep. So not only can our quality social connections help us to be more successful, they can help us to be more fit, they can help us to feel mentally strong. And really all of these factors play a role in how young we feel, how healthy we are. It is impacting our gene expression and how basically we're, we're designing how we can be the healthiest we can be even on a cellular level. Because I think people realize that even though you can't like touch it or see it, stress you can really feel. Yeah. And people get that there's a lot of stress and anxiety in life, but I don't think, which is why I wanted to talk about it, which is why you wanted to talk about it, that people need to understand just how large of a, a negative impact stress plays on your immune system. Yeah. Like right now during this pandemic, we all need to have healthy. I just saw somebody writing that they have the virus right now. Take care of yourself. Um, but how much it impacts our immune system, our cellular structure, our brain, our, the neurogenesis going on in our brain. And yeah. yes, our the how successfully we will age and eventually our longevity. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, what we do today really affects what our life's going to be like 10, 20 years from now. When you think about it, our friends kind of set the bar, right? And I think there was this one I don't know saying on Instagram. It's been out there a long time. Look at the five people you hang out with, and that will determine your level of success. And so we really do. Um, compare ourselves in a good way to the people that we are interacting with? Are we doing everything we can do to have a quality life? So isn't it nice to know that that's based on choices, choices anyone can make? And uh, as far as Kathy Lee in my book, uh, she talks a lot about spirituality. Yeah. And I'm a big believer, you know, whether you believe in God or not, kind of this idea that there's something bigger than yourself because it's so easy to make ourselves the victim. We very much are inclined to see ourselves that way. And it's through taking ourselves out through spiritualism, it can help us to see the bigger picture. And it can really help to reduce our stress levels and help us to understand that there's something bigger and better waiting for us. It's interesting, uh, Linda Pala, I think it is, not expecting things from other people right now, and that is freeing me from feeling hurt from others. Mm. Interesting. A lot of times, life isn't really what happens, it's how you react to what happens and, yeah. and what your expectations are. And sometimes they're unrealistic expectations. I remember that I used to go and meet somebody for lunch all the time and she was always late. And like, you know, you're there like, come on, like, the worst. We even talked about this. <laughs> so, I mean, after a while, what's the saying um, that if the person who keeps on doing things and expects a different outcome, yeah. that, that that's the definition of insanity? Yes. <laughs> but yes. it's certainly the definition of unhappiness. Yeah. You know, what I tell my patients uh, who are, are struggling with this disappointment, and sometimes I say, ex expectation is disappointment waiting to happen. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's like one way of looking at it. But I think it's important to have categories of friends. You know, your friends that you go shopping with, 
the friends that you can talk on a deeper level to, the friends that maybe you socialize with, so that you understand who a person is and you don't expect them to be more than who they are. And if they don't belong in your life, then you can segue out and, and just not have them be a part of your inner circle or your circle at all in a nice way. But it's knowing who you're dealing with and where to place them that can really also add to the tapestry of an enriched life. I, I That's such great information. And, uh, you know, just kind of an ending. When you think about going through this process, because, I mean, everybody has some kind of stress and anxiety in life, but... I think where women are different, and I truly believe that we are very different animals in this yeah. sense. Men, somehow, I mean, it's the way we term it is that they compartmentalize. But basically, you can have a disagreement, and like an hour later, you can say, be saying to you, the woman will be saying, I don't believe he hasn't called me to like talk about that. Meanwhile, he hasn't given it a second thought. But somehow, the female brain and heart and soul. Yeah gloms onto these things. And I think that this is just a bigger issue for women, don't you think? And we need to acknowledge I, that. I mean, I think men can experience that, but women are more verbal and we interact <laughs> on a very deep level. And I think when you look at male friendships, right, it's more based on what they have in common. And yeah. it's not these verbally deep conversations. So I think women, yes, think a different way, attach in a different way, and also yeah. have more words to describe their emotions as well. Yeah, we we talk way more than men. <laughs> way more than men. Men like action. You know, if they hear someone talk, they're like, all right, all right, what's the point? How yeah. can I fix it? And women, we don't want the fix. Just listen to me and empathize with me and we'll be good. <laughs> And we all have to remember that as women, we have to kind of acknowledge that. Um, love, love, love this session, says Irma Acuna. Thank you both. You've both spoken and addressed to me at 68 years old on so many issues. Wow. I'm so, doesn't that, I mean, you're like me. I said, I said to, to, uh, but Robbie earlier, I think we were separated at birth considering yes. what, we're, what we're out there talking about to other women, what we're writing about. <laughs> uh, well, I am very honored to be in that category, Joan, because the people who interact with you absolutely love you and you mean so much to the people that interact with you and you're kind. You will just give advice to somebody who wants it and needs it even if you don't know them. So I know that from my own personal friendships who have told me that about you. And you just interviewed, uh, my daughter just interviewed you on her podcast, which is called Off the Gram. Yes, yes. She is wonderful, warm, lovely, smart. I knew her when she was in PR and um, our professional lives, you know, have just, you um, come in contact with each other multiple times. And she's an influencer. She's on QVC. She has the best body ever. Joan. I mean, hello. I don't know. I produce that. I mean, I come on. Lord, Lord, a uh, beautiful family. And just, again, is on a mission to help women feel their best from her perspective. Yeah, that's uh, she's like a little Joni. That apple doesn't fall far from the tree. She's a mover and a shaker. She is, but in the best way. Yeah way that comes from a good place and she has meaningful relationships yeah. and she understands the value of female friendships. She's oh, a yeah. Whatever you did, you did right, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, this was awesome. I'm so glad and uh, I look forward to being on your podcast. Yes. And if you fun. want to hear more from Robbie, you, uh, watch her Facebook watch show on Facebook at uh, facebook.com talking live with Robbie Ludwig. Thank you so much. And thank you for sending me your book. I got through almost all of it over the weekend and I, I loved it. And everyone who gets the book should read Joan's chapter because she is the midlife mentor on resilience. Yes. All right. Bye-bye, Robbie. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. All right, you guys. I know we had, a, I've got a lot of things coming up. If you weren't with us at the beginning, um, I've got some amazing guests this week that I'm going to share with you. Sometimes I, Sometimes it blows my mind when I reach out to people that they say, sure, I'll come on your Facebook Live. Uh, Dr. Maria Carrillo, tomorrow she is the chief scientist 
at the National Alzheimer's Association Global Research Program. You know, this is um, Brain Health Awareness Month. And I think that we're all really uh, wanting more information on our brains, how we can protect them, how we can recover memory, how we can keep our cognitive thinking going. I mean, you really we need to crack the nut also on this dementia and Alzheimer's so that as we all age, that we have quality of life. Wednesday, Dr. Mike Dow, he um, you've probably seen on a million things. He's just been on so many things that I couldn't even start listing them. But he uh, his most recent book is called The Sugar Brain Fix. And as soon as I saw that name, I said, I've got to talk to this guy. Um, I mean, Thursday, I have Dr. Daniel Amen on. Um, you've, I'm sure, seen him. I've watched all of his PBS specials on the brain. And um, uh, he's probably the leading psychiatrist in America. He's written so many books. I mean, I've got, I'm just looking at him right now. Um, change your brain, change your life. Change your brain, change your grades, feel better, fast, stay that way, and mental illness. Um, I mean, I don't even know how many books he's written, but he is, um, I, I just can't wait to talk to him on Thursday. And then on Friday, we're going to end on a fun note with Robin McGraw. You all know Dr. Phil. If you watch his show, you see Robin. Well, she's a force in and of herself. Um, she has her own podcast. I was just on her podcast. She's so much fun and so real. And she wrote a book that's very similar to Robbie's book and to my book, her book. And I love this title. What's age got to do with it? Um, don't you just think of Tina Turner uh, um, just immediately? So we've got a great week coming up and I will see you all back here tomorrow. Uh, I didn't get to all of you. Oh, here's Pam. Uh, yeah, you love Dr. Amen too. Um, and here's Robin. Uh, I'm a former Takaho mom. I've enjoyed your Facebook Live sessions. Uh, that's awesome. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. All right. Namaste. Everybody stay safe, safe and healthy. Bye-bye.